Welcome to the Tokyo Photographic Art Museum's first ever live streaming online gallery tour in English. I'm Keishi Mitsui, curator of 19th century photography. Today's speaker will be Alice Goldenker. She is a writer and researcher and she did the English translation for this exhibition. So, she knows it well. Please, Ayas. Thank you for that introduction. Mitsui-san and I have been working together for about seven years. I've done the English translation for most of his exhibitions, and since 2014, we've been working together to give English ga gallery tours as a service to make the museum more accessible to the international community. Now, normally we would be doing this in person. We would invite you into the museum to walk through the galleries with us. Because of COVID-19, we can't do this th that this year, so we're trying this streaming format. It's a little bit new to us, um, so we're not sure how this is gonna work out, but we hope it will work for you. Due to the format, we can't answer any questions, which is unfortunate, but we are recording this and it will be available on the museum's website and archived here on the museum's YouTube channel, but it may take us a day or two to get that up. However, eventually, there will be a way for you to see it again if you'd like, or to recommend it to your friends, which we hope you'll do. Um, many of you are already familiar with the Tokyo Photographic Art Museum. It's located in Tokyo, in the Ebisu neighborhood inside of the Ebisu Garden Complex. When the museum opened in 1995, it was very unusual for photography to be featured in the art museums in Japan. So the museum played a very important role as the first public museum in Japan dedicated to photography and moving images. The museum was significantly uh, renovated and updated in 2016. So if you haven't been there recently, please do stop by and check out the new look. The exhibition we're talking about today is on now at the museum. It's continuing until January 23rd, uh, sorry, January 24th. It's an exhibition of early Japanese photography and it's one of the, of the first in a series that will focus on specific regions in Japan. This one focuses on the Kanto region, which includes Yokohama and Tokyo, two very important places in the development of photography in Japan. As such, it's a very good opportunity to learn about significant firsts in the history of Japanese photography, which I'll be talking about as we go. But first, let me give you an idea of what the exhibition looks like. There are about 200 exhibits in the, ex in the exhibition, including early cameras and equipment, as well as original photographs and related materials. There are three sections. The first section focuses on the period from the time photography was invented in Europe and the time that it came to Japan some 15 to 20 years later. The second section focuses on photographers, key figures in the history of photography in the Kanto region. The third section is an opportunity to see what the capital, well, sorry, what the Kanto region looked like uh, from the, 19, the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, from the time when the capital was still called Edo, and then later how it developed after it was renamed Tokyo in 1868. Now, I'd like to give you a few hints on how to enjoy the exhibition. And the first hint I want to give, uh, you can, we can start by looking at the raised case in the photo on the right, the second photo. You can see there's a case that's raised off the ground. Let me give you a better look at that. You can see it brings the photographs to eye level to make them easier to see. You can, it's, the case is also freestanding, so you can walk all around it and see the photographs from 360 degrees. Now, this is a fairly unusual way to uh, exhibit photographs, but it's something that Mitsui-san likes to do in his exhibitions. And the reason is, is he wants you to look at photographs as objects. 
Now, we're so used to seeing photographs on our phone or on our computer screen, and we forget that in the 19th century, photographs had to be attached to something. They were either on a metal plate or a glass plate or a paper backing, and those backsides of photographs can often carry very important information. For example, someone might have written a hand note on it saying when it was taken or who, who's in the photograph. Or it may have the mounting of the, the mount of the photographer, which could carry the photographer's name and even perhaps the address where he was in business at the time the photograph was taken. So they're very important. So if you do get a chance to go to the exhibition, please do take a moment to appreciate the opportunity to look at photographs uh, front and back. Another hint I have for you is that you should come prepared to read. This is a text-heavy exhibition, and uh, the te it's a text-heavy exhibition with a uh, lot of information, and fortunately for those of us who don't read Japanese well, it's an opportunity that most, almost everything has been translated. There's a lot of information here that you won't find easily elsewhere in English. So if you're a serious researcher of Japanese photography, uh, do read those panels. There's a lot of great information there. When we talk about the invention of photography, we usually point to the year 1839, which is the year that a method called the daguerreotype was announced in France. In actual fact, the invention of photography had been going on for a long time before that. Um, there were a lot of people doing a lot of important work that contributed to this development, but uh, the daguerreotype gets the credit for being the first practical method that could be learned relatively easily and practiced by a large number of people. The French government bought the process uh, and they uh, released it to the public patent-free so that anybody could do it. And this created a huge sensation. It was just a game changer. To explain very simply what a daguerreotype is, it's an image that's captured on a metal plate. Uh, to simplify greatly, you take a copper plate, which has been treated with silver, polish it to a mirror shine, treat it with chemicals to make it photosensitive, put it inside a camera obscura, we would say a camera, expose it to get an image imprinted on it, then take it out and treat it again through many steps to make the image visible and to fix it so it won't disappear. It's a lot of work. It required quite a lot of skill, but even so, it was a revolution that made portraits accessible to a huge number of people that couldn't have their portraits painted, for example. Um, the image that you get with a daguerreotype, you only get one image. So there's a single plate that goes into the camera and you get one photograph, no duplicates. But it's a very durable image, far more durable than the film photographs that were taken of me when I was a child, for example. I don't think I can overstate what a revelation this was to the people of the time to be able to see an image that was so lifelike, it really created a huge sensation. This is a lithograph that um, tries to capture that feeling of the time. It's a little hard to see here. We do have it in the exhibition, so you can see it uh, if you go to the exhibition. But it shows hordes of people lining up for miles so that they can have their daguerreotype picture taken. Um, because the French government made this technology available to everyone for free, it spread very quickly throughout Europe and to the United States. But what about Japan? Well, let's think about the situation that Japan was in in 1839 when the daguerreotype was invented. At that time, Japan was in an extended period of national isolation. It had been going on already for more than 200 years. Japan had almost no contact with the outside world, particularly with the West. Uh, people were not allowed in, and Japanese subjects were not allowed to leave the country upon pain of death. And that would continue for another 15, 14, 15 years after the daguerreotype was invented until the Americans arrived with gunboats uh, commandeered by, or 
commanded by Matthew C. Perry, demanding that Japan open to America and the West. And yet, we have these daguerreotypes that were taken of Japanese people while Japan was still in that period of national isolation. Well, how could this happen? Photographers weren't allowed in, Japanese weren't, out a lot, weren't allowed out. How did these men have their portraits taken? They were castaways, shipwreck survivors, sailors uh, who had been sailing near the coast of Japan when their ship was caught in a storm. They lost their mast. The ship was carried out to sea where it drifted helplessly until they were rescued by an American whaler. The American ship took the sailors back to San Francisco where they created quite a sensation. Nobody had ever seen Japanese people before. And an American photographer made dagger type portraits of each of the men. We have two of them in the exhibition. These two were discovered in Paris uh, in the 1980s and acquired by the Kawasaki City Museum. This is a closer view of one of the photographs. I'd like you to notice the rough clothing and the untidy hair. Uh, those details make these portraits very different from most of the 19th century portraits that you'll see of Japanese people, which are, who are generally um, samurai or high-ranking officials posed in formal clothing. Now, these two daguerreotypes have their own story of survival. Those of you who live in Tokyo um, certainly remember October 2019 when a powerful typhoon, uh, Typhoon Hagabus, hit the city. It caused the Tama River to overflow its banks and terrible flooding in the neighborhoods around the river, including where the Kawasaki City Museum is located. The museum's underground storage facilities were flooded, uh, destroying many important items in the museum's collection. But fortunately, these two daguerreotypes, these very important, very historical photographs survived undamaged. Interestingly, this portrait of, is of one of the castaways, a man called Iwakichi, who learned English during his ordeal uh, on the sea in, in America. Um, and returned to Japan to work for a while for the British legation in Edo. That's kind of like the precursor to the British embassy. Um, he worked there as an interpreter until uh, 1862 when he was murdered. He was cut down by a samurai who was disaffected, uh, unhappy about the Western presence in Japan. So those were the first photographs ever taken of Japanese people. How about the first Japanese, sorry, how about the first photographs taken on Japanese soil? Well, those were taken by an American photographer called Ella Fallett Brown Jr. And he was a member of the crew of the crew of Perry's second mission, which came to Japan in 1854. And he brought with him a daguerreotype camera so that he could record uh, the mission with photography, something very new. We know from written records that Brown took several hundred photographs during his time in Japan. But unfortunately, almost all of his original work was lost. They were taken back to America and destroyed in a fire. The only original examples of his work that we still have today are a very few number of portraits that he took of Japanese people that he met along the way. This is one example. It's of a man named Kurokawa, who was an official in Shimoda. Um, and the photograph must have been taken at the time that uh, Perry's ships stopped in Shimoda. As you can see, some of the image is lost. It looks sort of cloudy. Um, that's because somebody at some time rubbed the surface of the daguerreotype, probably trying to clean it. That's something you shouldn't do. Now, if you want to see this particular photograph, you need to get to the museum by December 27th. Um, after that date, there will be a change of exhibits and we'll have another original example of uh, Brown's daguerreotypes, but it won't be this specific one. This is how Brown's daguerreotype is exhibited in the exhibition. It's the third item in this case. The red is the inside cover of the case in which the daguerreotype is stored. Next to it is a book. 
This book is the official record of the Perry mission. It was illustrated with a lot of beautiful illustrations. It had a lot of information about Japan. In addition to being submitted to the government, it was also sold publicly and sold quite well because everyone was curious about this country of Japan that nobody had first-hand information about for several hundred years. Now, when I say that there are illustrations in the book, let me show you that the book is open to a page. At the time that this report was published, there was no way to include photographs in a book or a newspaper. There was no way to reproduce photographs on the printed page. So what they would do is hire artists to make lithographs which they could reproduce on the printed page based on the photographs. The photographs were still useful in guiding the, the artists in what to make. But interestingly, um, the photographers often made composites. Let me just show you a closer look so you can see what I mean. You can see um, that that's Kurokawa there in the center, but in the original photograph, there's nobody around him. What lithograph lithographers often did was they would make composites looking at two or more photographs and combine them. Sometimes um, they were faithful uh, to life and other times they included uh, details from their own imagination, maybe a building or plants. And we know that because there are a few examples of illustrations in the report that have plants in there that didn't exist in Japan at that time. But this is an interesting example of how photography was used in disseminating information about Japan to the West. It was really, those photographs were really very important. So now I've just, uh, we were talking about the first photographs taken in Japan. How about the first commercial photographer? Brown was just a visitor. He was there on business, but he was just there for a specific mission. He was not um, in business for himself selling photographs. So who was the first commercial photographer in Japan? Well, that title belongs to an American named Oren Freeman, who came from Shanghai in 1860. And he set up a business in, the Yokohama, in Yokohama in the foreign settlement there. Um, he had sort of a souvenir shop, and as a sideline, he sold photographic equipment and made photographic portraits. Now, you may notice that this photograph looks a little different from the ones that we were looking at before. These are not daguerreotypes. This is a different photographic method that came along a little bit later. It's called an ambrotype. The daguerreotype never really caught on in Japan. Um, other more recent methods, by the time photography came to Japan, there were other methods that became uh, more adopted in Japan. An ambrotype, remember the daguerreotype was an image on a metal plate. An ambrotype is an image on a glass plate. And it actually comes out looking like a negative at first. But when you put a black backing on it, either black paper or black cloth, the image appears positive. And as far as we know, all the surviving examples of Freeman's work that we have are ambrotypes. We don't have any evidence that he made daguerreotypes. Freeman is important not only because he was the first commercial photographer in Japan, but because he taught photography to someone else. And that was a Japanese man named Ukai Gyoksen. This is an example of Ukai Gyoksen's work. It's also an ambrotype. And this particular photograph is very important because it proves that Ukai Gyoksen was the first Japanese to go into business selling photographs, selling and making photographs. Um, now, if you've had prior experience with Japanese photography, you might have heard other names before. Um, you might have heard the name Shimaoka Renjo, who was a photographer who worked here in the Kanto region. Or you might have heard the name Ueno Hikoma, who had a studio in Nagasaki. These two men are often quoted, are often mentioned as being the fathers of Japanese photography. But thanks to recent uh, scholarship, we do know now that Ukai Gyoksen came first. And this photograph that you're looking at right now was very important in proving that because there's written documentation showing the date it was made, around September of 1861. We also have a chart 
that ranked popular occupations and popular people in Edo at the time, and Ukai Gyoksen is mentioned as a photographer on that chart, which was published a few months earlier in July. So with those two pieces of evidence, we now know that Ukai Gyoksen came first because the other two men were not yet in business as photographers. So that's a very important image. We have this image and we also have the chart in the exhibition if you're interested in seeing them yourself. Yokohama was a very important place in the development of photography in Japan because just about everybody, uh, all the important figures in early Japanese photography came through at one point or another. But important things did happen in the capital. And the role of the Tokyo Printing Bureau is not very well known, so I'd like to just speak about that for a moment. The Tokyo Printing Bureau, Tokyo Insatsu Kyoku in Japanese, was where banknotes were printed. But the Bureau also worked on research and development related to printing, and at that time, photography was a very new and promising technology for the printing industry. So the Bureau wanted to have its technicians trained in photography, and they also wanted to get the Japanese public to be more familiar with photography as a medium. So they offered portraits. They would make portraits for a fee right there on the premises. And this is one example. This one was made in 1879 of Iwakura Tomomi, who, was, uh, who led one of the first important diplomatic missions to Europe. I'd like to turn now to another groundbreaking photograph. Uh, not this one, uh, not yet, but this one does set the stage. Photography was very difficult and complicated in the 19th century, but there were amateur photographers among the foreign men who came to work in Japan as engineers and advisors to the Meiji government. And we believe this was taken by a French engineer who came to Japan to help build the Yokosuka Arsenal, a big industrial complex that the French were building. It's still under construction in this photograph. This is a dry dock where ships are built and repaired. And this dry dock was the scene of an international incident involving photography. It happened in 1872 on New Year's Day when the Meiji Emperor made an official visit to the arsenal. And this is the photograph that was taken then. This is a very famous photograph, well, infamous actually, yet not that many people have had a chance to see it. There are very few prints of it, and there are very few, it's, it's very seldom exhibited. And yet everything about this photograph is fascinating. Let's start with how it was taken. The photographer who took this picture was a photographer who worked in Yokohama, an Austrian named Raymond von Stilfried. Now, this was the arrival of the emperor in Yokosuka to the arsenal was big news for the foreign community in Yokosuka. So naturally, they wanted to record, get a record of the event. Uh, Stilfried, von Stilfried um, applied to the Meiji government asking for permission to phot photograph the emperor. He was denied. He tried to bring in his equipment on the day and was turned away, so he resorted to subterfuge, hiding himself in a boat and his equipment and taking a picture uh, totally without authorization. Nobody knew he was taking it. This was quite a difficult thing to do in the 19th century because the exposure times were so long that it was virtually impossible to take someone's photograph without their cooperation. If they moved during the exposure time, the photograph would be blurred. So he worked very hard to do this. Um, it's a little hard to see here, but perhaps you can see it better um, with this detailed photograph or better yet, go to the exhibition to see it yourself. But there's significant retouching on this photograph. And of course, this was before Photoshop, so everything had to be done by hand. For one thing, the background of trees is artificial. That wasn't there in the original scene. For another, um, the faces and heads of many of the figures have been retouched. This was surely done because they were blurred, because the subjects moved during the time the photograph was taken. So the photographer went to a lot of effort to make this photograph. Why? Well, he expected it to be a really big seller. Up until this time, the Meiji Emperor had never been photographed. There were no uh, 
no images of him available to the West. Everybody knew about this new Japanese ruler who had been enthroned in a famous coup d'etat, but they didn't know what he looked like. So I'm sure the photographer thought he was going to sell a copies. However, when he placed an advertisement in English language papers in Yokohama, um, the Meiji government got wind of this and got very upset. They did not want an unauthorized photograph of the emperor circulating around the world. So with the Austrian representatives in Edo, sorry, in Tokyo, um, they put pressure on the photographer and came to some deal with him to suppress the photograph. And this is why there's so few copies available. However, the Meiji government did learn from this that they'd better make an official photograph, uh, an official portrait of the emperor. And they hired a Japanese photographer, Uchida Kuichi, to make a formal portrait, which looks like this. This is actually not an authorized copy. Uh, this is somebody making a pirated copy. They took a photograph of a photograph and were selling it on the side. But it's quite interesting to see it, and it is in the exhibition, so you can compare the face, the real face of the emperor as shown in this photograph, with the one on the retouched photograph. Let's turn now to the third section, which shows us what the Kanto region looked like. This photograph was taken by a very famous photographer who came to Japan. His name was Felice Beato. And he made um, a series of wide angle photographs, panorama photographs of what the city looked like in 1863. To do this, he went to the top of Atogoyama, which is a large hill uh, in present day Minato Ward. It's 26, about 26 meters high, so that was a good vantage point from which to photograph the city. At that time, you could see all the way to the sea because there were no, no high buildings there. Um, of course, there were no wide angle cameras or uh, panorama features on the cameras in those day, settings in those days as we have now. So to take a photograph like this, Beato would take a series of prints carefully positioning his camera so that it would be virtually seamless, and then he would join the prints together. He made several which are in the exhibition, and you can see from them what Edo looked like at that time. It's very interesting, important photographs. Beato also took regular photographs, single views. This is one of Mita, in, also in current uh, Minato Ward. The building on the right of the photograph is samurai housing. It's the Edo compound of one of the feudal lords. And today, um, that's about the place where the Italian embassy is located. And the sort of top left of the photograph where the trees are, that's about where the Mitsui Club is. So you can see how much the city has changed in all this time. Another photograph that I found really interesting was this photograph of the Nihonbashi Bridge. Uh, it was taken in 1872 when the bridge was still made of wood. The bridge that's there now is made of stone on a steel frame and was built in 1911. Unfortunately, it's been obscured by the raised uh, highway that was built, in, built for the 1964 Olympics, but this is what it looked like even earlier when it was made of wood. Now, I knew about the Nihonbashi Bridge before, but my image of the bridge was formed largely by what I'd seen in the famous woodblock prints. This one is by Hiroshige, but Hokusai also did them. And to me, the bridge looked very grand and imposing. Yet in the photograph, if you look closely, and you can do that if you go to the exhibition, there's water stains underneath the, the, the area where the pedestrians are walking and the pillars in the water are crowded by ratty old boats. And I, I don't know, it was just a completely different image from what I had formed before. And so I found this particular shot very interesting. Another one that I found interesting was taken after uh, the capital was renamed Tokyo. This is the foreign office, Gaimusho. And I was surprised that it was a Japanese style building. I, I don't know what I was expecting, but I didn't think that this was how the foreign office would look. So that was a very interesting photograph for me as well. We saw before the photographs that Beato took from the high vantage point of Atagoyama. Here we have some photographs that were taken 26 years later from an even higher point. Um, 
they were taken from the scaffolding that you see here uh, in at the at the, the scaffolding that you see here which was built um, put up for the construction of the Nikolai Cathedral a Russian Orthodox Church that still stands today in Chiyoda Ward we know from newspaper accounts of the time that a photographer we're not sure which one it is, it's either Tanaka Takeshi or Esaki Reiji, uh, went to the top of the scaffolding and took a series of photographs that together form a 360 degree view of what Tokyo looked like at the time. And this was quite a dangerous undertaking. Uh, at the same time, there was a carpenter who lost his footing while working on the scaffolding and fell to his death. So the photographer and his assistants were really risking their lives to get these photographs. And it's even more amazing when you consider that not only did they have to carry a heavy camera and a tripod, but also all the boxes of glass slides that they would need to take um, the photographs. So it was quite an undertaking. This is one of those photographs. They're arranged in the third section of the museum in a room so you can see them along the wall in 360 degrees. This particular shot I just chose because I thought the western building uh, in the back was quite interesting. That's a teaching school, a normal school. I also have a detail of that photograph for you so you can see how clear and how much they record. I found it interesting to see the western style building mixed in among the Japanese houses. Of course, all these buildings are now long gone. Well, we can't talk about photography in the Kanto region without talking about a very specific genre of photographs called the Yokohama Shashin, Yokohama photographs. Now, if you look at this, these photographs like this were um, almost exclusively sold to foreign tourists. Uh, this is why you see photographs that look like this very often in foreign collections. And the really salient point about them, is if you look at them now, I mean, they're beautiful photographs in and of themselves, but look, there's color on them. And yet this was a time before color photography was invented. So how did the color get there? Well, this photograph might make it a little, these, this, these two photographs might make it a little easier to understand. This is the before and after. The color was added by hand with paint and brush uh, by very talented artists who did a really good job at this hand coloring. And we have in the exhibition two sets of the paints that they use, so you can see that as well. Both the paints and those before and after photographs are in the second section of the photograph if you want to take a look. Uh, this is an interesting example of a hand-colored photograph. It's of Mukojima, which is a popular place in Tokyo, for especially for during the Sakura season. It's a nice place to go see the flowers in bloom. You can see in the upper right hand corner of the photograph a cherry tree, all lovely and pink in bloom. Another interesting thing about this photograph are the white signs that you see hanging on the lamppost and from the eaves of the tea house there. Uh, those of you who can read Japan, Japanese, perhaps you can see it. It says, Ebisu Biru, Ebisu Beer. So even in the late 19th century, uh, cherry blossoms and beer went together. I'd like to end with one more photograph, this amazing photograph of Tokyo Station under construction in 1911. This photograph, this view will be very familiar to those of you who have lived or traveled in, in Tokyo. It's what we now call the Marunouchi side of the station. The building here that we see being constructed here was renovated recently um, and looks really nice these days, but of course, the area around Tokyo Station now is completely built up with high-rise buildings. At that time, there was nothing around it. Yet, the photograph seems to be taken not from ground level, but some sort of raised position. The, from the angle, we know that it's about where the Marunouchi building is now, the Marubiru. Um, since it's raised up, we're guessing that the photographer either brought some sort of platform with him that he could use to raise himself up for a better view, or perhaps there was some sort of scaffolding or other platform there that he 
was able to climb up on. The people that you see in the foreground, um, they would not be there by accident. The photographer would have most likely arranged for them to stand there to provide a sense of scale. This is really a lovely photograph, and if you have a chance to look at it, I highly recommend it. So the exhibition, again, is on until January 24th. We hope that you'll have a chance to go see it. COVID measures are in effect. The staff will take your temperature at the entrance. Masks are required. There's hand sanitizer available, and there are social distancing markings on the floor. And I just want to speak to those marks a little bit because there has been some confusion about them uh, from recent visitors. They're black dots on the floor, and nobody means that you have to stand on those black dots. They're just spaced to give you an idea of how far apart 1.5 meters the recommended social distancing distance is. So please use those as your guides to keep a safe distance from other visitors. Um, finally, if you do have a chance to go to the museum, um, I encourage you to check the museum's website before you go. The situation with COVID-19 is volatile. We don't know exactly what's going to, be, to happen. So be sure to check the museum's website to make sure that the museum is open to avoid disappointment. We do hope you get a chance to see the exhibition. Thank you very much for tuning in. Anything you want to say, Mitsui-san? Thank you very much. He says, thank you very much. And I thank you too. Best wishes for the holidays.